Okay, so the session is now being recorded. And for any of those who have just joined us, you haven't missed anything, apart from the fact that you may hear that uh, my voice is a little bit dodgy and uh, it's a little bit of a head cold. So bear with me. Hopefully it's not too painful on the ears and um, I'll hopefully get through the one hour. Um, now, before digging into the detail, I just wanted to um, present or, or make you aware of a couple of things outside of the Unified Basics. Uh, the first one is that we did a survey recently on what should be in Unify 14 and, and, and get some feedback with our, with our clients and our end users. Um, I can't emphasize enough how much I appreciate the feedback that we got. We had an excellent response to the survey and, and the only way we can make our product right is to really listen to what you guys believe we need to do to make it a better product. And so um, you can actually read the results of that on our blog. Uh, so we go to the unify.com.au website and um, in the bottom uh, navigation, right at the bottom, there's a whole heap of um, things you can find out about us. One of them is our blog. Uh, when you click on that, you'll get the first entry will be the Unify 14 survey results and, and you can read up on those. <coughs> what has come out of that, obviously, we, we plan to release our next release in um, late July, early August. And so we need to have scoped uh, that pretty well by now. Um, what we're targeting is 50. We're targeting 50 small usability improvements that users have given us, um, ranging from all sorts of things, um, you know, different text size for different types of readers, uh, so you can automatically change the text size in the screen, um, little things like that. Just small, tiny improvements that will make a big difference, but won't be you know, all singing or dancing in terms of their key features. Uh, that's the first uh, thing that's come out of the survey. The second is, um, I'll just scroll down so you can see the first pie while I talk, or the first couple of pies. Um, Outlook integration. We have it already, but uh, it, it was done 10 years ago. It's time for an upgrade, and people have been giving us some great ideas as to what to do with that. So there'll be some new Outlook integration functionality coming out as part of Unify 14. Uh, new visualizations, new graphical uh, integration between um, the data in Unify and the way you can access it um, will be in Unify 14. Uh, resource planning, we've developed a uh, more tactical resource planning capability that's already actually complete and some clients are getting it as we speak. So if you want to be on the bleeding edge and get our stuff and it just comes out, um, you can let us know and you can get updates more regularly than the two a year that we normally do to everyone. Uh, and that resource planning is basically where people are able to um, uh, forecast their timesheet rather than just do actuals. And then obviously the portfolio aspect kicks in and you can have a look across the portfolio as to who's over allocated, who's not, and how you can move people around to support client deadlines. And then finally, the other big feature in Unify 14 will be some feasibility modeling that we've been working with our aged care property developers uh, to, to get that. But it'll be a generic modeling kit, but they've been helping us with what they need specifically. And we've been looking at um, how we can make that a generic model for people to use to do their own feasibility on, on developments or on IT projects or on whatever your, your particular business is working on. So that's some uh, updates on where we're going with the system and the fact that the survey results are out there for you to see. The other piece of information I just wanted to let you know of today is <clears throat> we're having a end user meetup in Melbourne. Apologies for those not based in Melbourne. We will be getting to Sydney and Brisbane soon, and if you're outside of that area, hopefully one day. Um, but these meetups are really for end users to get together and talk about what they're doing with Unify and to share stories. Uh, so hopefully you potentially could create your own in your area if we don't set that up yourself. Let us know and we may be able to sponsor the event. Um, so this meetup is on the 23rd of May. We have a guest speaker, Judy Gardner, has wonderfully accepted to present how she is integrating the business management system at SMEC into the actual doing of a project and how you can then um, create a simplified audit and traceability, start to get value out of your business management system compliance rather than just as, a, as an auditing uh, function to really quality assure your project. So that'll be an interesting presentation. I'm looking forward to it. If you want to join, um, there'll be a, an email out later um, next week with the details, but you can also look us up on the meetup.com and, um, and register. Uh, so that's at 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. on the 23rd of May at uh, Henry and the Fox, which was where we did our first meet up last year, if you remember, on 
on the back of Little Collins Street. Um, okay, so now getting into the stuff you all signed up to here, which is actually the Unify Basics information. I won't bore you anymore with promotional information. For those who are late joining, haven't missed anything yet, we're just really getting into the, the guts of it now. <clears throat> so the first agenda item is really just simple stuff about the browser, and there's really only two things I want to present today um, around that. The first one is the use of multiple tabs. Um, it's a really powerful uh, thing when using a web browser. If you've got two screens, you can have two different um, uh, views of information in Unify at the same time or you can toggle within one screen. And basically, within the browser, there's a couple of tricks to do that, depending on how you operate. So I use a, a laptop and I'm always using the, the, the finger pad, but um, if you've got a, a mouse and you've got a middle wheel that scrolls up and down, if you push down on that middle wheel, it will actually open a link in a new tab. Um, similarly, if you right mouse button on a link, so these are all links you can see when they're blue, they're links. If I right mouse button on that, it says open link in new tab. And I basically up the top, you can see it's loading. And when I click on it, I'm in a, a different screen showing milestones for that particular project. Excuse me. Um, okay, so that's two methods. The other one that I use, because I'm on a, on a laptop, and I'll use this frequently when I want to review um, lots of things all at once. I'll hold the control key down and just click. Uh, put the control key down, I can click any link and it'll open up in a new tab. And so then I can click on those review what I want to review and when I close it, it goes to the next one that I open and then I close it and then I close it and I close it and I just keep going in until I've finished and I'm back at where I started from and I've either updated due dates or I've added comments or I've done stuff that I wanted to do on those multiple um, screens. So um, I find that very useful. I thought I'd bring it to your attention. For me, the best is the control click, uh, but the middle mouse button works pretty well if you use a mouse as well and you can just open five or six tabs. Um, I mean, I have developers in my office who have you know, 20 or 30 tabs and I just can't work with that level of uh, confusion, but um, open at one time, but uh, you know, and I like to close them down being a little bit of a, a, a sort of um, methodolog methodological follower. But um, anyway, that's the way I, I use Unify in that context. The other um, aspect that you can use Unify for is, um, uh, sorry, the web browser, where you can use the web browser to benefit your use of Unify is, just within a page, sometimes you want to find something, you know it's there. You've already done some filtering. We've filtered for overdue, and we're getting a list, and we've filtered for issues, and we're getting a list. So filtering is very powerful, and you can find something worth, worth using as often as you can. Um, but then you want to find something, and in the browser, you can do Control F. And if you type a word, it'll start to show you that word and how many times it's present in the page, and you can toggle through it. So again, that can be quite a handy um, web browser function that isn't Unify created. It's actually developed in the browser for you to find a piece of information from a filtered or even Unify searched subset. So when you have a, a subset and you want to find that information, you can do that. So there's two pretty simple tips from the browser, uh, getting a uh, better value out of using a web application. And that's obviously available for any web application you may use in your organization, not just Unify. Okay. The next part I wanted to talk about is a common support call. Uh, you'll hear that the most common support call is, oh, I've forgotten my password. And that's something else we're looking to, to solve, single sign on into the future. Um, and better um, simplicity around username and, and password without compromising security. But in the meantime, the second most uh, frequent support call we get or support uh, email is where did my issue go or where did my document go? And it basically all comes about because of my work versus my portfolio versus portfolio. So this chip over here is a filtered chip. It's the default view when you log into Unify. The first view you get is my work summary. The logic being that this is the things I need to do. And I can filter that as you saw before for what's overdue or the next seven days and just see what I need to do. I can then remove that chip and I'll go into the portfolio view of Unify and see all the projects. The main difference between my work and the my portfolio slash portfolio is that this is only showing you things you need to do 
when you're in portfolio, it's everything that people can have to do. It's all the documents in the population of the database. And my portfolio is all the things that people need to do on your projects that you've been assigned. But my work, because it's basically things you need to do, if you stay in my work and you select a project that's gone into the Charters Towers one, and I'm going to add an issue, something's come up and I need to log an issue. And I just go in and I say, type, losing my issue, and I hit save. And you can see it's not there. And they'll go, where did it go? And they'll go, oh, I must have done something wrong. I better do it again. And validly so. Uh, it is a confusing thing, but it is a challenge because you didn't actually assign it to yourself. And because you're in my work, you couldn't see it. So if I do another one, and I, I don't know that I'm on this project. Yeah, I think. This time, because I assigned it to myself, when I save it, it's in my list. It's all right, there it is. But if I remove the chip, I've also got a lost one. So it actually would be in there twice. And you can see maybe that's what happened with these three tests. So um, just need to be aware that when you've got the My Work chip there, unless you assign the issue to yourself, when you hit save, it won't immediately be apparent that it's actually safe. Um, the other one we get is related to documents. So I'm just going to go into the document system now. And I'm in portfolio. You can see there's no chip there. Uh, when I click a new document, I'm just going to make up uh, a simple document here. Doesn't really matter what it is. This is an accounting cost template. It's got an accounting one step accounting cost view that brings in month, year to date, and total values. When I click finish, there's a document status. <coughs> now, any of the things other than private, it means it's viewable by uh, anyone with a program manager license, anyone with a um, license that's actually allocated to the project can see that. But when it's in private mode, it can only be seen by those who can edit that document and collaborate on it. Um, basically, it's a way of writing up a document without everyone being able to see it before it's actually finished, ready for review, either as a draft or open for review or awaiting sign-off. So if I don't publish it out and I go and I just leave it there and I click closed, the document exists, but it won't exist in this view that I'm in because this view is the portfolio view. It's all documentation. The status does not have private. I can't filter for private documents. To access documents that I'm working on, I need to be in my work. So when I go and change my view through the filters here and select my work, there's my accounting cost document in private mode and I can edit it. And if I then publish it to draft and close, this time when I get rid of my my work chip, it's now there because it's in draft mode. So hopefully that clears up a couple of times where you might be a bit confused as to where information has gone. Um, just subtle different views of filters means you can um, be missing things. You know, I mentioned you know, filtering, as you'll see in the communications tab, is a pretty powerful thing. But the only trick is once you've filtered, you can sometimes forget you have. And I catch myself um, in this from time to time where I've filtered for something and I'm going, where is that issue or document? And it's because I filtered for a template or I filtered for a waiting sign off um, and, and, I, and I can no longer see it. So just check your filters and reset them back to all and you'll start again. Which takes us to um, search. For me, um, search, free text search is um, great. Uh, but before I do that, I always do filtering. And one of the, um, filterings that you can do within um, the documents module that we're in now is templates. Now, <clears throat> one of the challenges for new people working with Unify is to understand that it's a matrix model and therefore it's not like a Windows Explorer folder structure where you might have a pro all your projects as the first level folder. That means you can never look across projects. You can never see all the business cases, all of the, um, you know, invoices that are being raised across all projects. Because Unify's matrix, you can you can filter in different ways and it's always reducing the set, but it's not reducing it in a hierarchical sense, it's reducing it in a matrix sense. <clears throat> so 
So this list here, this is a list of all of the templates that have been used on this particular project, the Charters Tower project. And when you select it, it's kind of like drilling into a folder in Windows Explorer. If I have a folder for certified progress claims, I could go certified progress claims and I get, you know, uh, probably I would have subfolders for the suppliers, but I can see them there. Um, another unified basic is that you can sort on any of these. So you can sort by supplier by clicking that list. I can sort by status and it changes that by version, whatever um, in that list I can sort by. But this is only showing me not all the templates that exist for this deployment, but just the ones that have been used for that project. If I select a different project, that list will change and the list will be shorter. You can see there's no scroll bar on this one. That's all of the templates that have been used on that particular one. Um, the fact that it's showing the supplier is again a bit of a unified basics. When you select a template that has contractual information in it, it'll show you something about that in that particular um, one. If I select invoice, it'll show you the principal. Because typically the supplier is yourself, so we're not interested in knowing that we're the supplier to our own invoice. We want to know who we're sending it to. <coughs> So there's a bit of context in, in what you're getting in all of this stuff. Go back to certify progress claim, get a supplier, get all, and, and it disappears and it just tells you what template was used for that particular document. The filtering is quite a powerful thing. It extends even more in this advanced search. So um, this search here is what we call advanced search <coughs> as opposed to this one up here. And what it does is it brings in all of the um, filters that belong to documents that have been created in this project. So if anyone saw last month's webinar, we showed you how you can create custom lists and you can associate those custom lists to all sorts of things, one being document steps. Now, in our surveillance work or in defects and things like that, you can fill in a, a document on site through a, a mobile app and you'll design that by creating these lists. And so you, if I click this, this is like surveying a box culvert on a road and the person would have gone out on site with their phone and, and all with their tablet and filled in a tick box basic approach of, of saying what they were surveying. What I want to do now is I want to actually say, show me all of the surveillances that were um, surveying these three types of box culvert in, uh, things and um, give that to me on the surveillance record, which in the wrong project, if I go all, it's a better, better experience. So I'll start from scratch. Um, so I'm selecting those three elements. So it'll only show all documents where they have been picked. And I want to show my surveillance record box culvert. And then there it is there. So there's a few hundred documents in this deployment and it's found the three that relate to that particular template where um, those particular sections were ticked. Um, sorry, I refreshed those. Yeah. And there were none. Um, unticking them. Bring back the three that had some solution in there. You have a look at one. So I'll just open up these documents. And you can see that's what would have been filled in on site. <coughs> Then, if that still has too long a list, you can use keyword search that will search the text within the document. And so, you'll find any uh, rich text that you've entered into Unify into a rich text step and return. I can't remember the keyword I had. My head's not working properly. Okay, so I just picked pass and it came up with business case in there. But if there was text within that, I'm just going to open in a new window and control click. Rich text. Thanks. I'll go back to all business cases and demonstrate the rich text search. Apologies for this. I did have a key word, but it slipped my mind and I didn't write it down. Trick for young players there. Here we go. A few of these. Let's see what I'll do. Create one. 
So the key is that it's a rich text box. Building this Doncaster Road project. So a rich text box is where you have these um, Microsoft Word style um, icons that you can do things with, including inserting tables. And um, you can see that the, the name of the project and the idea dynamically came into the thing. That happened through template variables, which can insert dynamically. This little dollar sign, you say, okay, I want the project description that's being written about this project. You do that. And when you hit save, project is abba dabba dabba, beauty. Um, so that's a good one. Let's just leave that there. And if I save this and publish it, I'll search for that. I'll publish it. And then search. I'm not going to bother with any filtering. I'm just going to go straight to the keyword search. And there it is. So yeah, if you've got any documents that have got rich text um, in them and you're trying to find a document that you know you've written, you can go all projects, search the keyword, and then if you really want to find out where it is, you can use that control F that I did before. And then you can see up the top here, we've got Abba Dabba Dabba, and there it is. And I knew that Abba 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 actually would come to my rescue. So that, that was a little bit more painful than it should have been, but hopefully it got the message across. Um, that advanced search within the document system. Another search that can be useful is within the contract system when you when you get a lot of contracts within a project, or even across all projects as a sort of benchmarking or exploration thing. If you have a project a, a deployment that's been up for a while <coughs> and you're new to the business, you might want to see um, if they've used a particular supplier before, and so. If I search within the dashboard of contracts, I'm in the contracts module, these are all projects that have contracts, there are quite a few projects. And I just search for a company name. It'll basically list all of the projects that have that con contractor um, being utilized. You can see that list is a lot less than the list that I had before. And then when I click new tab on any of those, I can then control F and type birdcat again. And you can see there's three contracts on that particular job. And so we're combining the knowledge, there's only one on that one, and that it is BirdCat. And um, I saw why BirdCat came up on that one. Um, it might be the, the principal. Um, oh, there we go. Yes, it was the principal instead of the supplier. Um, so that would be interesting. I think that would be something quite difficult to do in your typical Windows Explorer environment is to know what suppliers you have used and on what jobs and what was their tender value and all that sort of stuff. Particularly within the resources system, you've got, um, again, they need to be all projects, so going back to the resource pool. Uh, all projects. The home key goes to all projects. That's uh, something that people may not know in the inside base. You've got to sort of it. I'm drilled into a project, power outage, technical support. I want to go back to all. I just press home key and I'm back to all projects. The other thing that's um, a 13.01 release, some people have got the early release, may not have this, but um, if I was to say type AM, and it searches for AM. If I hit enter, it actually selects the first project in the list. I remove that and say store. It won't do store redesign, it'll store, store program. If I hit enter, instead of having to move my mouse to select it, um, so I'll just type store, hit enter, picks the first one in the list. I find that really useful. Um, so going back to all again by going home, I'll start search up here. And you just need to know what sort of custom field information is available to you. So if I was to go and change this view to say, show me all the organizations in my pool. Hang on a sec. Oh, slow death. Um, <coughs> right. We've got all these organizations. Uh, we're scrolling down, they're just companies. And I click in on one of them. You can see that they have just the one 
custom field. We've recently configured uh, a pretty interesting uh, CRM pipeline process from prospect campaigns through to opportunity submissions and post um, award wins. And one of the custom fields we created for that was whether that organization was a prospect. And then what you can do is just search yes. And it'll pull back all of the all the organizations that you've actually flagged as being um, a prospect across thousands of organizations. If you come up with something more nuanced, like at the moment we've created a April campaign and we flag companies as being in that campaign. And so you can actually type in here April campaign and hit enter and it brings back all those organizations. Similarly with the contact, if you go to the contact view, these are people. Again, if I just click in on a person, you can see that any of this information is searchable. So we've got this bizarre contact field in our demo system called Sam A, B, and C. So that was to actually test uh, team-based profitability. Now I remember. Um, maybe that's a topic for another webinar. But um, it's pretty cool. No more inter-company inter invoicing. But uh, this person's on Team A. If I wanted to see all the people that were on Team A, again, I can just go back to the dashboard and type Team A. And these people, you saw the pool was much bigger than that. So there's five people on Team A. I don't know if anyone has been so it's not Team B. I'm feeling saucy here. Let's try it out. Oh, there you go. There's Team B, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, it's not just what you see in this screen that's being searched. It's actually the, the data that sits behind those people. And if you know it, you can find that information out. Um, so if it's a campaign, for example, and you've typed in the campaign, you can then just got their phone numbers and everything else. You can start hassling them and drilling in and making comments when you've made the call. So again, if, a, if it's a control click, you open up a new tab, make the call, and you may not know that you can write comments against people. Um, name, phone to Ali. Oh, yeah. Did not leave message. It'll time stamp me doing that and other people can have their go and what have you. Right, enough of search. <laughs> the next one is about bulk updating. And as I mentioned, um, this got a little bit um, more nuanced in the new interface. And so it's probably a topic worth um, showing. The first one actually links to our last um, topic, which is license and access level. What I want to do is, and what's a common requirement, if you're using unified practice management and you're tracking opportunities and submissions, you're obviously going to have a lot of those. Depending on your win-loss ratio, you're going to have a lot more of those than going to post award. Um, and so you need to move them out of these phases and into these phases. It's quite an important thing to do. So if I was to filter for submission, part of my data management exercise, I'm now getting only three projects in this particular business. They're obviously struggling a little. and But I want to move a couple of them because we just won them, these top two. And so if I tick these boxes, you can see that the filters disappear on the right-hand side, this, this filtering here, and the buttons here disappear, and I get, which are action buttons, and I get a new button, which is life cycle phase. And I can just tick that and select a post-award phase. And um, by doing that, I've now moved it out of submission and into that phase. If I remove the chip so I can get access to those, and here was one, one of the things that you should know about that is that it will move the dates of your schedule. So the asterisk here is the current phase. We were in submission. We moved to concept today. And you'll see 24th of um, April 2018, 25th of April 2018, are the, are the two dates that it said finished and start based on that moving. Capturing that and the, um, the revenue that you expected to get actually drives the submission dashboard. Um, that any? I didn't. Uh, if it had a snapshotted budget, um, that dashboard would have been representing that budget. So in the reporting module, there's a dashboard. And there's a submission dashboard. And these values are dynamically updated based on 
the value of the revenue budgets in the system. And whether you won them or lost them, you can see we now won one here because I just moved it from post award to uh, not post award and it had a value. Um, and so those bars have changed and that value's come down because that's the one we won and we now got lots of money, $200 million. Wow, that's a real pinky under the chin moment. And um, you know that's dynamically being updated by the, the one change you did, the bulk update on the life cycle. Um, so there's a lot of things going on when you add data and unify. Um, knock on effects, if you, if you will. Um, one thing, looking at that, you would have seen that all, I mean, all projects summary again, this is portfolio view. I've got the entire portfolio of projects in this dummy database, there's two pages of them. <coughs> and I've got a checkbox against every single one. That's because I'm logged in as a system administrator. If I go over to this one, I'm now logged in in Firefox, I'm logged in as a different user, and I'm logged in as Bernard, I think. Yep, or Bernard. And you can see that that box only appears on a few occasions. If I filter for my portfolio, it may be a little bit more prevalent. Yes, a little bit more prevalent. The reason it shows on this rather than this, even though I'm on that project, is because of my access level. I need to be in a project manager access level or above to be able to change a life cycle. So uh, Bernard can change these ones, and if he ticks, he will be able to do that and move them around. All the way across every single module, that same concept will exist. So if I go to issues and I select a project, I can tick these and a whole heap of things that I can do to them come through. Uh, I can complete them, I can change their rating, I can change their due date, find new people to it. Arthur's in charge, and I can move them. Because again, oops, add it. Sorry about that. Just cancel that. And tick, <coughs> and move to a different project. It's in the wrong one. I can do that with documents and risks as well. So bulk updating. Look for the ticks, and then suddenly new buttons will appear. Um, because of screen space, that's why the, the filters disappear because sometimes you have a lot of uh, filters, a lot of buttons and a lot of filters and they clash. So when you tick, they disappear, these come in, do your stuff, and whenever it's um, finished, the filters come back. <coughs> Want something myself then? All right, there's one other thing I forgot to conclude in the agenda that I was wanting to show you. In Firefox, this is what I'm in now. I, I, most of the presentation has been in Chrome. But in Firefox, we should be able to code this up to work in all browsers, but at this point in time, it's a Firefox theme. Um, if you're in a rich text box, which happens in the comment system, as well as in the document system, as we saw before, you can actually paste in a picture. So. You might use print screen, but that's a little bit big. I prefer the snipping tool these days. So if I go back to this screen for a minute, say you wanted to send us an error, or you wanted to import an image from somewhere, you can just copy it from wherever you get the image. I'm going to create the image first just by doing a snipping tool and just snip a piece of information. So I've now got an image that looks like that. I'm just going to use the snipping tools copy function, but you could use a, a copy function on the actual file in Windows Explorer as well and just paste. And you can see, paste directly into the into the comment so that you can actually see it in there. Um, if you didn't like the size of it, you could edit and reduce the size here and, and paste in a smaller one. Or, I guess this isn't Unified Basics, but you can actually edit that image as well by clicking on it, edit the image. Now, typical width would be um, between four and 500 pixels. So the left hand side is width on the dimensions. So if I do 400, oh, that's a bit small. That's what I thought it was. Insert edit image. That's a right mouse button thing. Probably double that size. And then it's a little bit better. Everyone can see everything that's in there. So a little bit of fiddling after that. But it's a little bit more 
um, I don't know, easier to follow for a person reading the comment thread than the other option, which would be to upload the image as an attachment. <coughs> Excuse me. So if I have no idea what's in here. <coughs> There's no preview of that particular image file. People have to download it and open it up to actually see it. So, well, this there is, I'll write again. Not quite as big. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's up to you. You can upload the images instead, or you can paste them in using Firefox's function. It's a, a pretty cool process, actually, the code that sits behind that, and the way it actually renders the image, but that's for a, a different topic. Okay. I'm getting to the end of my voice. We've got one last bit of this um, webinar, and I'll, I'll call over for questions. Get ready, Simon. Um, and that's about a very quick introduction, I guess, or just a, a, a teasing into the party role model that exists in Unify. To explain it, what I'm going to do is start in the resources tab. And everyone has either no license at all, so that's just your resource pool that you might correspond with externally by emailing out of Unify or saving from Outlook into Unify. Very valuable thing to do. Um, or they have a license. And there's four um, license levels. Project manager, team member, and um, program manager are the main ones. And then there's system admin. And again, I can sort on this. I get all the administrators there. I sort again, and I get all the team members. And then if I scroll down, I get the program managers and the project managers. So what does that mean? What the license level is, is what you can do within the application generally. So you saw that there were bulk update buttons, you know, boxes for me to tick as an administrator where I had all of them, whereas Bernard only had some. Um, that sort of thing, whether I can reassign work in the issue system. You can get a, a feel for it on our website. If you, if you go to our website and you click on any of the um, functional modules here, there'll be a um, bit of a tick box here as to what those levels can do. And uh, for each of, the, each of the modules within the application. Um, but essentially, it's given you rights to do stuff within the system. Team member, for example, doesn't see portfolio, they only see my portfolio. So they have to be on a project to know it exists. If you're in a uh, project manager, same deal. Program manager, they can see all projects, whether they're on them or not but they can't actually do anything on a project except read. They can't write, update, create, unless they're on the project. But then what they can actually do on a project depends on the access level of the role. So if we go into a project, you can see that people have roles. Um, so depending, first you need to have a license to be able to do something, then you need to be on the project, and then you need to be in a role, and that role inherits stuff. And to know what that stuff is, you need to know your methodology. This is the integration of BMS into practice. And so if I go into configuration, or methodology, sorry, and I go to roles, you'll see an access level against each role. So each deployment has their own list of roles. So you can make those up that match what you want people to be in, their roles and responsibilities. But then you also give them an access level that is the same naming convention as the license and it inherits the same kind of capability. So you can't put someone into a program manager role if they only have a project manager license, and you inherit the capability on that project of that license. So you may be a program manager license, but you might be put into a team member role. That means on that project, you can't assign work, you can't set due dates, you're just a participant. You're a very important participant, adding comments and adding your own issues, but you can't manage, you're not a project manager. So you need to know how those things interrelate with the role that you're in start to understand what people can do on a particular project. For example, team members don't even have access to the costs and contracts module. If you're a program manager license in a team member role, you can't create budgets, you can't create contracts. You can on other projects where you are in that role. Then we get to workflow, which is even more complicated, and it's driven by the template system. And it's basically almost unlimited configuration capability. So again, in methodology, in templates, <clears throat> when I create a template as an administrator, one of the things I can decide is for this particular document, 
what access level can actually view it. So if I was to select program manager and I'm a team member or someone is a team member and they log in, they wouldn't be able to see this document when it was created. If someone creates a document from this template, team members won't be able to see it. Then over here, basically say who can who can create it? Who's who's in the edit, update, create? And you basically tick the box. When you tick the box, it enables you to then also, depending on the template, set delegations for that and start the workflow through that. And then once they've finished and put it as a waiting sign off, who can sign it off is another tick box down here. And so <clears throat> you've got for every template its own model to work with as to who can sign it off, who can edit it, who can view it, and within that even at what delegation, depending on the template, if it's a, a contract related or budget related template. Um, so there's a little bit of sophistication there because we need to comply with a, a lot of different client requirements around you know, signing off of contracts, approving invoices, approving budgets and setting baselines and that sort of thing. So talk to your system administrator if you think you need to be accessing information on a project and you can't do it the way you want. It may be that it's just a configuration change that can be fixed up quite quickly. Okay, that's my monologue for 45 minutes. I hope I haven't put you to sleep. Lunchtime, we must be getting hungry, but before we break for lunch, I'll just unmute everyone and at worst receive my Dorothy Dix. Yes, this, here's the Dorothy Dixon, Mark. <laughs> Cheers, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> so that minimum access required to view documents there that we're just looking at, is that, and we're thinking about it, is that the, the license that the user has or the role um, level? It's the license. Just thought I'd clarify that. Thanks, mate. That's great. Any other questions? I need to get to Dorothy Dix the next time. That'll start the roll. Oh, I've got another one. If you want another Dorothy Dixer, go. So, given given that a, a project manager and a program manager, when they're assigned to a project, can have basic have the same editing level rights on a project. That's right. Why would you have any roles that are program manager and not just project manager? Um, don't know. <laughs> uh, it's a good question. Um, we, we, should, we should plan these Dorothy Dixes ahead of time, really, shouldn't we? Yeah, yeah, I'm supposed to have my answer pre, pre prepared. Um, yeah, so basically, it's a good question. There's, there's no difference on the project itself. Um, so, yeah, it's a bit moot differentiating between the two. I guess the only thing is, if you then integrate it with the document system and you had people in, okay, I have my answer. This is it. Uh, it's actually to do with the workflow. So if a um, person needs to be in a program manager access level, although again, it's more the role. Ah, no, okay, it's integration. So if I ticked off, let's say these people and I made them a project manager role instead, all right, instead of a uh, project, program manager, anyone, you can put anyone into their lowest, their highest level of role. So you might not want to be able to enable people who are project manager access or license to actually put into the construction reviewer or contract administrator role. So therefore, yep. uh, on the project team, you don't want to add them to that role. So therefore, put that role as being program manager and then they can't go into that role and then you can set documents at that level and they can't ever be in the sign off role to sign that off. <laughs> Stop there. Yep, that, that was sense? the correct answer. <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> Taryn, I heard you talk. You must have a question through all that. I don't actually. Do One comment, though. I actually um, learned quite a few things during that session that I didn't know before. So I always enjoy joining in with these because I know I'll always learn something new. Yeah, thanks, Karen. Appreciate it. Oh, I recorded this one, so you can share it with colleagues when I publish it at least. Great. I might keep forgetting yes, to record. I'll do that. Up and I'll just have to talk to myself, which I do enough of anyway. So. <laughs> okay, if there's no further questions on the call, we will end it there, going once. 
Thanks for showing up, guys. We'll hope to see you next month for May webinar. Topic yet to be decided. Thanks, guys. Thank see you. Ya. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.